the committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. As a reminder, members participating in a hearing remotely should remain visible on the screen at all times throughout the hearing. And as with in-person meetings, members are responsible uh, for controlling their own microphones. Members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. In addition, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository to sccc.repository at mail.house.gov. Finally, members are, or witnesses experiencing technical difficulties should inform the committee staff immediately. So let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining this remote hearing. Today we are going to talk about cities and states working uh, to protect their communities and how to increase resilience to climate impacts. I recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, members, as, as Congress continues to work on much needed infrastructure and jobs legislation, the climate crisis keeps proving that we need generational investments that will create a stronger and more resilient America. As we speak, the West is facing a record setting mega drought, increasing risks of dangerous heat waves and wildfires and shrinking water supplies for millions of Americans. Severe storms, pers persistent droughts, massive flooding and other climate related disasters cost our nation nearly $100 billion in 2020 alone. And earlier this year, Americans experienced a deadly and destructive winter storm in Texas and historic floods in the Southeast. So we do not have time for half measures. The time to invest in resilience is now. The building blocks of a stronger, more resilient America are resilient communities and partnerships between federal, regional, state, local, and tribal governments. It's up to Congress to help build those strong partnerships with smart investments and a shared vision for a net zero future. That's what we'll focus on today. We're joined by an exceptional group of leaders from America's cities and regions to help us chart that path. They know that we all do not experience the climate crisis in the same way, and that climate risks make social, racial, and economic inequities worse. Communities of color and working class communities uh, are at the greatest risk when it comes to disasters, and they often have less capacity to adapt. In fact, just this week, the New York Times highlighted how FEMA's disaster relief effort, efforts often help white Americans and white communities more than communities of color, even when the amount of damage in neighborhoods is similar. That's why climate action must also create, create opportunities and strive for environmental justice that will protect everyday Americans regardless of their zip code and skin color. America's mayors understand these challenges. In Madison, Wisconsin, Mayor Satya Rhodes-Conway is showing us how to invest in clean energy while also creating prosperity in underserved communities. Through her Green Power Initiative, the mayor has helped train and hire diverse workers to install over a megawatt of solar energy on municipal facilities. And we've seen important progress in Los Angeles too, where Mayor, Mayor Eric Garcetti launched a strategic plan to increase community resilience and an initiative to bring the city's infrastructure into the 21st century. In Atlanta, the nation's 10th largest economy, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms has pioneered innovative resilience financing tools and committed to 100% clean energy by 2035, all while working to address social inequity and climate adaptation. And in the upper Mississippi, Mississippi River Basin, represented today by Kirsten Wallace, states are already working with federal partners to respond to the changes in rainfall and flooding. These are just a few of the success stories across America. Now it's time for Congress to enact ambitious transformational legislation to help communities, large and small, protect themselves protect their citizens and protect their budgets. Unless Congress acts, Americans will be faced with unsafe roads, increasingly flooded neighborhoods and worsening power outages. These costs and risks are growing. 
That's why we're here to pass the American Jobs Plan, which will make vital investments in resilience as we work towards fulfilling President Biden's vision of solving the climate crisis. The American Jobs Plan gives us a historic opportunity to modernize our infrastructure and, and our electric grid so that we're better prepared when climate disasters strike. And it gives us a chance to put people to work in good paying jobs, expanding opportunity and prosperity across the board and reducing carbon pollution that continues to warm our planet. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today as they tell us what they need to continue to build a climate resilient community of their own. Thank you for being here and I look forward to our conversation. At this time, I'll yield to ranking member Garrett Graves of Louisiana for five minutes for his opening statement. Thanks Chair Cassidy and Mayors, good morning. I uh, appreciate y'all y'all being here, Ms. Wallace as well. Um, Chair, thanks for your, your opening statement. And, and it's certainly an area where this whole resilience of uh, issues that we've been trying to address, the resilience challenge is something that we very much share being from South Louisiana, talking about recovery programs. Just last year, I think we had seven storms, named storms that affected our state, five of them directly affecting our state. Uh, in 2016, we had a thousand year flood and just extraordinary damages. And if we're gonna talk about recovery as well, uh, the Congress came in and provided $1.7 billion in the aftermath of that 2016 flood. I am very sad to say, very sad to say that after more than four years, only $667 million of 1.7 billion has been offered, not, not granted, offered to flood victims, many of which still don't have rebuilt homes and are living in, in, in conditions. This is in America. This is absolutely unacceptable. And I wanna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on a quick little tangent, but all of my Republican and Democrat friends that are, that are on here today, there were bills to reauthorize the Community Development Block Grant uh, Disaster Recovery Program. And I don't know a person, and, and, and Madam Chair, uh, uh, black, white, uh, anything. Nobody's benefiting from a program that runs as inefficiently as that one. But let me get back on track here. Look, it doesn't matter which city you're from. You're from Atlanta, where my sister lives, Mayor, she's your constituent. Uh, from Madison, Wisconsin, uh, Mayor Garcetti from LA. Um, it doesn't matter where you're from. The worst thing in the world we can do is have to continue relying upon recovering from disasters. It makes so much more sense for us to be resilient on the front end, for us to adapt, for us to make proactive investments in ensuring the resilience of our communities. And of course, resilience means economic resilience. It means resilience in our safety. It means resilience of ecological productivity. All of these comprise resilience. And we have seen as the um, as the chair noted, we have seen extraordinary dollars that are often wasted, and I say wasted, um, in the aftermath of a disaster because it, things could have been done on the front end that would have been so much uh, less expensive and, of course, would have prevented these communities from being impacted, being destroyed. At the federal level, and of course, being in the United States, one of the, the most powerful country or the most powerful country in the world, we often look at climate, we look at resilience in this macro level. I'm really excited to have mayors here today, have Ms. Wallace here today, because you are effectively the practitioners. You're the ones that are on the ground trying to figure out what does this look like? What is executing? What is implementing resilience look like? And Mayor Garcetti, I will, I will never forget your quote. I quoted you at a, at a markup session with Mr. Huffman uh, just, just uh, yesterday or day before where you came before the House Transportation Committee and said that a Republican is only a Democrat that has been through the NEPA process. And uh, you're exactly right. And so um, we have got, we, so, so part of this, you know, when I say y'all are on the ground and doing the implementation or doing the execution of these macro level programs and objectives that we discuss, We've got to talk about how we can put together a project development and execution process, a delivery process that reflects the urgency that many of you are facing. The example that I cited my home state of Louisiana, the fact that they've only executed on $667 million out of 1.7 billion that's supposed to be an emergency recovery program. This is only our own government getting in our way, re-victimizing our own citizens. And that is unacceptable. If we're gonna execute on infrastructure, whatever your definition of infrastructure, Infrastructure is. If we're going to execute specifically on resilience, on adaptation, if we're going to work to try and prepare our energy system and grid, 
for, for, for this next generation and these new technologies. We have got to have a project development and delivery process that reflects the urgency of the challenges that we are facing. Um, so um, I'm gonna give y'all a, 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 some of our witnesses says I want you to be thinking about it, a quick little preview of what I'm interested in hearing about, not necessarily in the opening statements, but at least in questioning. So, so I've said it twice, y'all are the ones that are on the ground executing when people talk about these macro issues of climate, clean energy and emissions reduction. I'm really curious to hear you talk a bit about when you go in and execute, how are you looking at, at return on investment and determining which actions to take that you think are most powerful and are things that, that, that um, most benefit your own communities. Um, but really excited to be here today or to have y'all joining us today and uh, look forward to your testimony. Madam Chair, yield back. Thank you very much. Without objection, members who wish to opening enter opening statements into the record have five business days to do so. Now I want to welcome our witnesses. We will hear from cities and from a regional group on their efforts to confront the climate crisis, including their work to reduce climate disaster risks, foster community innovation and leadership and resolve inequities to ensure that no community is left behind. The chair now recognizes Representative Brownlee of California to introduce the Honorable Mayor Eric Garcetti. Thank you, Chair Castor, for allowing me to introduce the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti. Uh, mayor Garcetti is really, truly a climate rock star. Uh, as mayor of LA for the past eight years, he has undertaken countless initiatives to make the city more climate resilient from his plan to make LA run on 100% clean energy by 2035, to his programs to provide equitable shade and cooling for low-income Angelinos. Los Angeles is a microcosm of both some of the worst risks posed by climate change from extreme drought to wildfires, while also being a laboratory of some of our best opportunities to fight back including the installation of cool pavement and innovative ways to increase distributed solar. Mayor Garcetti continues to lead with his fellow mayors, both in the United States and abroad. He created the Climate Mayors Network of nearly 500 bipartisan American mayors and by chairing the C40 Cities Climate Leaders Group, which is made up of 97 of the world's mega cities. On behalf of the select committee, let me also thank you, Mr. Mayor, for providing your insights over the past two years to our committee, particularly as we put together our climate action plan last Congress. Our committee and our country, thank you for all you have done and continue to do to fight against the climate crisis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Next, I'll recognize myself for the remainder of the introductions. Uh, we're going to have the Honorable Satcher Rhodes Conway. She's the mayor of the city of Madison, Wisconsin. Mayor Rhodes Conway has made climate action a central focus of her administration, launching the city's climate forward plan this year to invest in resilience, expand sustainable transit, and ensure 100% of municipal electricity needs are met with clean energy. Mayor Rhodes Conway is also the current co-chair of Climate Mayors, a bipartisan network of more than 475 mayors demonstrating climate leadership across the country. The Honorable Keisha Lance Bottoms is the mayor of the city of Atlanta, Georgia, a former judge and city council member, Mayor Bottoms launched her One Atlanta vision for an affordable, resilient and equitable city that catalyzes affordable housing, world-class infrastructure and thriving neighborhoods. Through the city's Clean Energy Atlanta plan, she has committed the nation's 10th largest economy to transition to 100% clean energy by 2035. Ms. Kirsten Wallace is the executive director for the Upper Mississippi River Basin Association. The association is a five-state interstate organization formed by the governors of Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, Missouri, and Wisconsin to coordinate the state's river-related programs and policies and work with federal agencies that have river responsibilities. In her position, Ms. Wallace develops regional positions, advocates the state's collective interests before Congress and federal agencies, and facilitates and fosters interagency coordination, cooperation, and communication. Uh, so without objection, the, wit the witnesses opening statements 
will be made part of the record. With that, Mayor Garcetti, you're now recognized uh, for five minutes for your presentation. Welcome. Well, thank you so much, Chair Castro. It is so wonderful to be with you, Ranking Member Graves, the entire committee. One of the last times I was in D.C. pre-pandemic was with you and enjoyed uh, around lunchtime sitting down and being able to talk to a bipartisan group of folks really coming from a nonpartisan or tripartisan perspective um, from mayors. And it's great to be with my uh, sister mayors, Lance Bottoms and Rhodes Conway. And thank you, uh, Representative um, Julia uh, Brownlee, who has just been a dear friend and a climate champion herself. Good to be with you, uh, Jared Huffman. I know Mike Levin, too, is part of this committee. Um, California strong. And, and thank you to everybody for your service. There's never been a tougher time to serve. I'll give you another quote, uh, Representative Graves, uh, somebody uh, once asked John F. Kennedy what it was like being president. He said, it's the best job in the world, just not right now. And I think all of us in public service feel that these are the best jobs in the world, maybe just not right now. So let's uh, stick with it and keep serving the people together. Um, look, I'll, I'll cut to the chase. You know uh, what Los Angeles, you see in the national news, how we're on the front line of this climate crisis. You see it in the fires and the wildfires, which is now not just a season of a few months, but virtually year round. You can feel it in the drought that the chairwoman mentioned uh, that we all are experiencing in the Western United States. Uh, you can see it in the heat uh, that literally is taking lives. We can't forget that every time it gets extreme heat, we lose seniors, we lo lose poor folks who uh, don't have the HVAC systems. We are seeing American lives at stake here. And so we need to survive. And I would say also we need to compete. We see a lot of gold in them, their hills. There's a lot of jobs, there's a lot of innovation. I'm so proud of the both houses of Congress looking at what we can do to invest in some of the key industries and artificial intelligence and semiconductors and all the things we've seen uh, some of our competitors doing around the world. This is also a place where it isn't just about our health and survival. It's about the health and survival of our economy and our vision of whether as Americans we can be innovative. If, even if you thought there wasn't a climate emergency, this would be an urgent time for us to lead in these industries and in transportation and buildings and energy. And so it's great to see a bipartisan group here uh, really looking and listening. And I would say what we need first and foremost is the bold ambition of something like the American Jobs Pro Program. Uh, I think a lot of people think that that's just Washington DC with too much money raining down and telling local communities what to do. I see a different picture. I see actually Washington listening to what uh, local communities are doing, states, counties, cities, uh, regions, where they're the ones on the front lines and uh, they're the ones who have to come up with the solutions to save lives and to save livelihoods. And, you know, it really is cities that are leading the charge in this, but we need your leadership as well. Um, I'll give you some examples of how that partnership occurs between local communities, and federal government. Our National Renewable Energy Laboratory, based in Colorado, did the first of its kind study in the world to look at how we could help Los Angeles, which owns the largest municipal utility in the country, get to 100% renewable power. 10 million scenarios using a supercomputer, some of the best scientists in the world. And the LA 100 study, which we released with the Department of Energy earlier this year, shows we can get there. And so I announced that we'd be 97% carbon free by the end of this decade and 100% by 2035, first big city in America to do it. We couldn't do that without local dollars and national innovation and help. We're making unmatched investments in water infrastructure, as you read about the Hoover Dam and Lake Mead being at its lowest level uh, ever, potentially. How we can recycle enough water that if you've seen the movie Chinatown is three times more than the aqueduct we built last century to steal all that water from up north. Uh, the innovation and the technology around water innovation. And the American Jobs Plan follows suits. It goes all in on drought ready water systems, recycling, stormwater capture, groundwater storage. It goes all in on energy by helping us support grid updates and ramping up our resilience, that word that you used, uh, Ranking Member Graves, to extreme weather events and creating a steadier flow of clean power. And in LA, we recognize that buildings too are the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases. And the American Jobs Plan tackles that challenge too, making historic commitments to public schools and public housing, greener buildings everywhere. We have to look at this as an equity issue, whether it's where we plant trees for shade for that senior who can't go and get herself groceries because it's too hot, or that student by the time she gets home who has a headache from the heat and doesn't do her homework because she can't and, and drops out of school. This is about human beings, not about programs and policies. This is not just about dollars, but this is about lives. And so we're so excited to be able to be a part of this conversation. I look forward to answering all of your questions and being alongside my fellow mayors and witnesses. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mayor. Next, uh, Mayor Rhodes-Conway, you're recognized for five minutes. 
Chaircaster, Ranking Member Graves, thank you so much for inviting me to discuss the importance of climate action. I'm proud to be the mayor of Madison, Wisconsin, which is the home to over a quarter million people, the Wisconsin State Capitol, and the flagship campus of the University of Wisconsin. I also serve, as you've heard, as co-chair of Climate Mayors, a network of mayors representing 476 U.S. cities who are committed to this work. And Chair Castor, we really appreciate your engagement with us last year. Cities are struggling with the challenges, including the global pandemic, climate change, and a legacy of centuries of inequitable policymaking. But we have the opportunity to recover and rebuild in a more just, resilient, and sustainable way. We need the support of the federal government now to overcome barriers, resource innovation, and scale solutions. Our changing climate exacerbates pre-existing challenges and creates new risks for every city in the United States. Madison is facing warmer summers, more precipitation, and more extreme storms, among other impacts. Warmer summers create dangerous urban heat island impacts, and heat is the leading cause of weather-related deaths. In Dane County, where Madison is located, we saw a 47% increase in heat-related emergency room visits between 2010 and 2014. And by mid-century, we expect the number of extremely hot days to triple and the number of extremely hot nights to quadruple. Many older rental buildings in Wisconsin lack air conditioning. They have poor insulation and they soak in heat through asphalt roofs. The technologies exist to reduce these heat impacts. And we have started a program in Madison to make energy efficient upgrades in apartment buildings. But without additional resources, we can only reach a fraction of the apartments in Madison. And these buildings need more than just energy upgrades. The wetter climate leads to wetter basements contributing to mold growth and respiratory problems. And while children suffer from asthma, parents worry about retribution from landlords if they report that mold. We are investing, investigating ways to add mold remediation to our programs, but again, that will take resources. Madison is experiencing more rain and more severe storms. Wisconsin has 15% more rainfall annually now than in 1950. And precipitation is projected to increase by another 15% by mid-century. The west side of Madison experienced a thousand year flood in 2018, which caused $154 million in damage in our county. That 2018 flood was a wake up call. We are now undertaking 23 watershed studies across the city to determine how to prevent persistent flooding and mitigate catastrophic events. We have identified $75 million worth of necessary projects in just the first four studies. To prevent flooding, we must make major investments in infiltration, storage, and stormwater system capacity. I believe our best solutions to the crisis are those that address climate change holistically mitigating our risks while supporting our city and both local and national economy. We must build infrastructure that withstands the impact of a changing climate, and we must ensure that our residents have resources to manage stressors like higher temperatures and crises like flooding in their homes and communities. All these solutions require extensive resources. The federal government's support for these local efforts could be transformational. Cities would welcome investments through existing funding streams, including DOE's Weatherization Assistance Program and Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grant Program, HUD's Community Development Block Grant Program, Sustainable Community Initiatives and Home Investment Partnership, the FTA Bus and Bus Facilities Program, and the Capital Investment Grant Program. But policymakers should also update these programs to make these funds more flexible or create new programs that enable cities to address a multitude of needs without silos. Climate change is the defining challenge of our time. Cities need the federal government to support our ability to innovate, to clear away barriers, and to bring viable solutions to scale. We have less than a decade to make a difference. Thank you for your congressional action plan for a clean energy economy. Thank you for your time today, but thank you more for your action. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, next, we'll go to Mayor Bottoms. Welcome, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and distinguished members of the committee and to my fellow mayors, it's an honor to join you today. 
Atlanta is the center of a metropolitan area of more than 6 million people. It's often said that all roads lead through Atlanta. And if you visit, you will be faced with that harsh reality when you hit our infamous bumper to bumper traffic, probably only second to traffic that you will experience in Los Angeles. It is a visual reminder of just how concentrated our population has become. In fact, 83% of Americans now live in urban centers. As such, cities like Atlanta can serve as a microcosm of issues affecting the entire country, issues like climate change. Over the past year, we have all faced unprecedented challenges, a global pandemic punctuated by racial justice reckoning, an economic downturn, spikes in crime, and a once in a lifetime election. No one escaped 2020 unscathed. And for that reason, many have called COVID-19 the great equalizer. But I don't believe that is true at all. In fact, COVID has only exacerbated the vast inequities that exist within our society. Inequities that are further inflamed by climate crisis that disproportionately affects our most vulnerable communities. So as we make the much needed turn toward recovery and we think about what it means to build back better, we can't ignore the role that climate justice must play in our plans for the future. This committee understands better than anyone how complex these issues truly are. Almost every challenge we face in the mayor's office, whether it's infrastructure challenges, unemployment, affordable housing, or transportation can be connected to climate change, which is why the solution must be intersectional, at, must be as intersectional as the problem. When I became mayor of Atlanta, I set forth my vision for One Atlanta a more affordable, resilient, and equitable city for all. Central to that vision are collaborative, bold, innovative ideas that address climate change, create economic opportunity, and confront injustice head on. That is why we are committed to 100% clean energy by 2035 and sustainable food access to as many residents as possible. We also established a community-led clean energy advisory board and joined the American Cities Climate Challenge. Work like this requires targeted investments in American cities to build out our nation's sustainable infrastructure, to create well-paying jobs, and to support a resilient clean energy future. In many infrastructure and economic recovery, in, in any infrastructure and economic recovery package, we also urge you to prioritize and expand programs where funds flow directly to cities from the federal government, prioritize local government-led processes for federal funds that flow to the states to improve inclusivity and accountability, ensure that federal programs and funding prioritize disadvantaged communities and allow sufficient administrative and implementation flexibility to meet local needs, ensure that federal spending is accompanied by workforce standards that prioritize job quality and equitable access to well-paying high road careers. Cities face specific challenges unique to their geographical areas and therefore require flexible funding, direct grants, block grants, et cetera, that allow cities to address their distinct challenges efficiently and innovatively while remaining accountable to grant requirements. While I sit here today in my capacity as mayor of Atlanta, first and foremost, I am a mother, a mother of four children with asthma. Just two weeks ago, I sat in the doctor's office with my son who has mild chronic asthma, as the doctor shared to, with me that the entire week his office had been flooded with children because the air quality was so poor just two weeks ago in Atlanta. So I know firsthand how climate change can affect real people in their everyday lives. We are dealing with it in my household. This is not an esoteric problem that we face as elected officials. It's a real world crisis that has already hit home for people around the world. Passage of the American Jobs Plan, including direct support to cities will build a more equitable and resilient country and your action will save lives. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today. 
Well, thank you very much, Mayor. Next, Ms. Wallace, you are recognized for five minutes for a presentation of your testimony. Welcome. Chair Caster, Ranking Member Graves, and distinguished members of the Select Committee, I appreciate today's opportunity to underscore the value of investing in both the economic vitality and ecological integrity of the Mississippi River. The governors of Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, Missouri, and Wisconsin formed UMRBA to foster and facilitate interstate water resources planning and cooperative action. UMRBA's premise for its ongoing work to enhance ecological and economic resilience to climate change is that regional science, collaboration, and planning will lead us towards regional resilience. We know that water, the amount flowing through the river, the duration it remains high or low, the rate of change between high levels and low levels greatly influences the river's resilience. Science is a fundamental priority. We have over 30 years of continuous monitoring through the Upper Mississippi River Restoration Program that allows us to quantify the ecosystem's resilience. In other words, its capacity to absorb disturbances and sustain its fundamental characteristics. Continuing this monitoring will allow us to make scientific observations about how the climate is affecting the river ecosystem and how species might use the Mississippi River's longitudinal orientation to adjust their respective ranges to their advantage. There is a tremendous amount of information at our disposal and ongoing and planned efforts to increase our knowledge of climate change risks, including our forecasting capabilities. Our goal is to integrate the natural and social sciences to evaluate the effectiveness of potential actions while considering the social, economic, and ecological dimensions of the problems and opportunities. This includes developing detailed assessments of the river's current and future needs for flood conveyance and storage and the unique causes of drought onset, magnitude, and duration in the watershed. Major river systems like the Mississippi River require a sense of unity and shared commitment to solutions. Unity requires an appreciation of neighbors and conflicting interests and common knowledge of the resources, the problems, and opportunities. It also requires us having a shared vision for the future and a plan to achieve that future. While local planning is incredibly important to the unique characteristics and resources of each individual community, the interconnectedness among stakeholders across the watershed calls for regional planning. Achieving resilience will reside in our ability to work together. The discourse will be contentious at times. The issues are personal and involve people's families, homes, and livelihoods. But as indicative of the past, collective planning that considers individual, community, and regional implica implications will lead to solutions that are carried forward for decades and have lasting benefits. Today, I would like to discuss a robust solutions for adapting to and mitigating the effects of climate change. The Upper Mississippi River Restoration Program restores the river's natural mosaic of braided channels and backwaters, increasing the quantity, quality, and, and diversity of habitat available for a wide range of fish and wildlife. The Navigation and Ecosystem Sustainability Program is a comprehensive and integrated plan for meeting current and future shipping demands by modernizing the lock system and improving the health and resilience of the river ecosystem. We respectfully request continued support for these two programs with a new construction start for the Navigation and Ecosystem Sustainability Program. The health, function, and viability of the main stem Mississippi River reflects the performance of the watershed as a whole. It is widely acknowledged that actions must be taken in the watershed. While important strides in conservation practices and point and non-point source loading reductions have been achieved, attaining the goals we have collectively set through the Gulf Hypoxia Action Plan will require acceleration of its implementation. We respectfully request an increase in federal support for the ongoing implementation of the state's nutrient reduction strategies including improving utilization of existing programs while dedicating resources specific to fulfilling that action plan. And finally, as the governor's joint interstate collaborative, UMRBA is serving as the convening entity for collective action to build the resilience of the upper Mississippi River to major flood events, prolonged drought, and excessive sediment through a unified suite of strategies and actions that would be implemented through a broad range of stakeholder authorities. UMRBA, UMRBA applauds this committee's focus on creating a national dialogue around climate change and on finding and investing in sound solutions. 
We believe that the science collaboration and planning on the upper Mississippi River can serve as a model for other regions of the country and other floodplain systems across the world. We would appreciate an opportunity to continue working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walsh, and thanks to all of our witnesses for your insightful and informative testimony. Next, we're going to go to member questions. Uh, I'm going to start and yield my time to Representative Escobar of Texas. Rep. Escobar, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and many thanks to our panelists. I know that we are all in this struggle together. I, I represent El Paso, Texas, uh, and I'm coming to you from the safe and secure U.S.-Mexico border community that is in the middle of the Chihuahuan Desert, a community that is dealing with uh, also with issues around drought, extreme heat. I mean, we are seeing more and more days with temperatures well above 100. I mean, just yesterday, this week, we're at 108. I, it, 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 we are rapidly becoming um, as hot as communities like Phoenix and Tucson that, that have dealt with extreme heat for long periods of time. But it's, uh, and, and we're dealing also with, with a shrinking, uh, shrinking amounts of water in the Rio Grande. So I know we're all in this really catastrophic struggle together. Mayor, I, Mayor Garcetti, sorry, when I say mayor, there's three of you who will not. <laughs> mayor Garcetti, I've, I've actually, I've been looking into a lot of the work that Los Angeles has done specifically mm -hmm. on solar. Mm -hmm. And um, we have, you all heard about what happened in Texas with the grid. El Paso actually is on the Western grid. Mm -hmm. So we were exempt from the, the, uh, the terrible consequences of what happened with the grid in the rest of Texas. Um, but, and, and we have a, a utility, a, a El Paso Electric mm -hmm. is about to build a, um, or is, is seeking to build a new power plant that is going to be utilizing natural gas. And many in the community have been pushing on the utility to go solar, to, to instead of creating what could be at some point a stranded asset, and that's how um, Secretary John Kerry has, has, has deemed some of these strand, you know, as, as stranded assets in the future, um, many are calling on them to just move towards solar far more quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And what we hear back is that the challenge is storage and that, that the technology and capacity is still not there. I would love to hear about what you did, yeah. what's happening in Los Angeles, and how you charted that path. Well, thank you so much, Representative Escobar. My grandfather crossed that Chihuahuan Desert uh, through El Paso as a baby in my bisabuela's arms to, to come to this country. So it's wonderful to, to uh, have the Chihuahuan Desert um, uh, evoked. Um, so, you know, we are the number one solar city in America, um, and you're right, it is a more complicated power source. And we've kind of taken a threefold approach. One is massive solar arrays in the high desert north of, of LA. Um, the biggest and cheapest in the country with storage is under construction right now, the Elan Solar Project, and it's cheaper than a new gas plant. Uh, so on the cost, it's actually quite effective. Second, we have a feed-in tariff that allows huge warehouses and other um, buildings uh, to basically become power plants for us, and our utility pays them. And third, distributed solar, which is at the neighborhood level, in which you have it on households, including low-income households, and looking increasingly at storage and building out the grid that it can accommodate much more generation there. We had recent wildfires. Los Angeles City never had any outages because of that, but it came close because it cut off power lines that come in from other states, um, and we came within a percent or two of needing to have some blackouts in order to manage um, our, our electricity. So I would say this, one of the ways you can look at solar is, yes, battery storage, but that gets you only through a day or two. It's not long term. We're also looking at excess wind and solar through some of the lines that come in from Utah and looking for um, green hydrogen. Um, we put out an RFI uh, to store green hydrogen, but to create that using the excess solar. Um, under our biggest power plant in Utah, which we have the biggest ownership of, there are salt caverns uh, the size of Empire State Buildings, about uh, seven of them, and we're looking at uh, firing up our turbines with a combination of natural gas and hydrogen, trying to get all the way to hydrogen. So it's a way to store the solar production and the wind production in something that if you need, for instance, after an earthquake in our city, uh, weeks of power, that would be much more dependable. So it's a combination of different types of solar, different types of storage, and looking at excess solar, um, and 
putting that in a usable fuel as well. Thank you so much, Mayor Garcetti. And uh, Chairwoman Castor, thank you so much for yielding to me and uh, your time. Appreciate it. I yield back. Right back. Uh, next, uh, Representative Graves, do I understand you're yielding to uh, Rep Palmer? Yes, going to defer to Palmer to go first. Yeah. Okay. Representative Palmer, you're recognized for five minutes. I thank the gentleman for uh, referring to me. It would have been helpful if you told me ahead of time, but uh, we'll discuss that internally next time. Uh, I am very glad that we're having this discussion about dealing with mega drought. And I saw Chairman Castor smile at that reference to Garrett Graves. Uh, I think it's time that we look at the, the efforts that we need to be making in terms of resilience because as I've tried to point out, point out on this committee many times, climate has a history. Uh, California, for instance, has a history of mega droughts. There have been at least four mega droughts over the last 1200 years that uh, have had enormously severe impacts. The one that uh, California is in right now uh, has a serious impact. And what I'd like to uh, ask uh, Mayor Garcetti is, Looking at, at California, the state of California's water policies and, and their failure to prepare adequately uh, for, for the drought that you're in right now should be of great concern to all of the mayors in California. You had a major uh, wet period uh, in uh, just a few, in 2019, record amounts of uh, snowfall. I think the snowpack was 153%, yet because of the failure to prepare uh, for uh, the wet periods, uh, you're really uh, struggling uh, in terms of your water capacity. How would you respond to that? Sure, a couple things. One is, is it doesn't resonate as much in the city of Los Angeles because we've been preparing for a long time and it's not a, a switch you can just flip right away. Um, we built out, for instance, a ton of uh, stormwater capture so that when that snow melted, eventually made its way down into Los Angeles River and other places, we now have huge catch basins I passed the largest um, water bond in, uh, at the local level in U.S. history as a council member that put a half a billion dollars into being able to really reinfiltrate that water uh, into our natural aquifers. Uh, as I mentioned, too, we're taking something that's three times bigger than the L.A. aqueduct by taking our wastewater plant, where 60 percent of our water flows through, gets cleaned up and then washed out to the ocean, the only place that doesn't need more water. And we're converting that into something that will give us enough water for decades to come. But I hear the point of what you're saying, and I do believe that both local, state, and federal government should be investing in that infrastructure, whether it's the WIFIA funds that are out there or other things of the longer term retention. Let me, I, yeah, I want to ask some other um, uh, questions of other members, but okay. I do appreciate that point you just made, that we do need to be investing in this, and California should have been doing this. There were, there, I don't think there's been a new reservoir uh, built in California since 1979. It not only would give you the water storage capacity, but also help mitigate against the flooding that uh, you guys went through a couple of years ago. Ms. Wallace, the same thing uh, with the, the Mississippi uh, uh, Basin. There were thriving Mississippian cultures uh, throughout the, the Mississippi uh, River Basin up until about uh, maybe uh, between 1200 and 1500, and they began to disappear large because of prolonged drought. Uh, this what we're experiencing climate change is not new. So in your work, how are you uh, preparing for, for the climate change that's coming that we can't do anything about? Are, or are you taking that into account? Or have you looked at the history of, of climate in the region? Yes, and we're continuing to do that, um, knowing what has happened and that, that history, but also what's likely to come in the future is driving our conversations there's a few things that we're trying to do to prepare ourselves for the future and act now. Um, you know, it's as much of a, a science element. So we are working on our science. We're working on, you know, a US Geological Survey now has um, a next generation water observing system program, which intensively monitors a basin and they're doing 10 within the country. One is on the Illinois River Basin, I extend down from Chicago down to the Mississippi River and we'll right. learn a lot about no Ms. Wallace, I'm going to cut you off. I'm, I'm very happy that you're doing that. I've only got a few seconds left. And I do want to bring this up. There's something very important to me because I grew up uh, dirt poor in, in rural Northwest Alabama. 
And I'm concerned there's an article that uh, was in the LA Times that uh, Mayor Garcetti that California's clean energy programs are mainly benefiting the rich. I'm a, I have grave concerns, serious concerns about energy poverty. Energy poverty in Atlanta, Atlanta has the third highest rate of energy poverty in the country among um, uh, US major cities. Same thing's true in Los Angeles, and I'm sure you're familiar with that article. So uh, Mayor Garcetti, said, I, I hope that in your clean energy plans, you're taking that into account that low income families need access to, to reliable energy. No, no question. And since we own our own utility, we're able to do that with probably the strongest low income assistance because we share that you and I together. Um, we have different rates. Uh, we have huge subsidies. And thanks to federal action, we have utility assistance from this pandemic uh, that we've also taken some of our coronavirus relief funds back when we called uh, things coronavirus um, directly into low income utility assistance. And finally, we put solar on the homes of low income residents because it should not be something that you just can afford to do. This has to be done for and by and with all Americans. Mayor Bottoms. Uh, I think we're, we're out of time, and okay. uh, but maybe we'll be able to come back and, and uh, Mayor can answer on another for, during another member's time. Next, we'll go to uh, Rep Bonamici. You recognize for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chair Castor and Ranking Member Graves, and thank you to our witnesses. I rep represent Northwest Oregon, and here in the Pacific Northwest, we know that climate change is not a distant threat. It's a reality. In fact, last summer, uh, a nearly a million acres burned across my home state of Oregon as a result of historic winds, dry fuel conditions. Uh, lives were lost, towns were destroyed, uh, and air quality surpassed hazardous levels across the state and, and region. In fact, I'm extremely concerned by recent outlooks from the National Interagency Fire Center that suggests that the lack of rain and snow could result in yet another horrific wildfire season. And today's infrastructure and building standards don't take future climate trends into account and current levels of infrastructure investment are not enough to respond to the threats of the climate crisis. So we can truly learn from local leadership about addressing the climate crisis while making our communities more resilient. So Mayor Garcetti, in your testimony, you noted the importance of energy efficient efficiency upgrades in creating good paying jobs, reducing emissions and improving air filtration for public health. So what are the current barriers for local governments in retrofitting public buildings uh, to serve as shelters during wildfires or extreme heat events? And how can the federal government better incentivize uh, weatherization and other programs to meet the needs of communities often devastated by wildfires? It's a, it's a great, great question. I think, you know, giving us those funds to be able to look at not just at building out greener power, but actually reducing and conserving um, and building that sort of resilience is critical. Again, I feel somewhat spoiled because we control our own utility. We don't have to negotiate with a private utility on this, but whether it's rebates for high efficiency air conditioning, uh, we install inst insulation for folks. Uh, we do have cold weather here too sometimes and obviously for the warm weather days. Uh, these sorts of things which can be co-owned by the federal government or incentivized by the federal government for utilities would go a huge way. It's usually pennies on the dollar for building out new things and building efficiency is one of the areas we certainly have seen our energy use go dramatically down per capita in the city of Los Angeles. And I would encourage the federal government to look at what they can do in other communities to mirror that. Thank you so much. And Mayor Rhodes-Conway, in your testimony, you mentioned the challenges of harmful algal blooms and hypoxia for beach and lake access points in Madison. And I know this is an issue that is of concern across the country. We face similar challenges across freshwater and marine ecosystems in Northwest Oregon. So how can natural infrastructure investments help address runoff and improve water quality to prevent future HABs and hypoxic events? Thank you, Representative. Uh, this is a, a serious issue for the city of Madison. We are surrounded by lakes, um, and it is no question that our changing climate is exacerbating this problem um, with both more runoff and uh, higher temperatures that uh, make the algae grow faster. And um, we are looking at, in I mentioned the stormwater uh, studies that we're doing, we are looking at how we can build in green infrastructure to, um, to slow that runoff, um, to infiltrate more water, um, and to clean the water that does end up in our lakes. And um, we spend a tremendous amount of time and energy on this, whether it's managing um, the leaves that fall <laughs> in, in the autumn um, and keeping them out of the lakes um, or in 
uh, helping people to build their own rain gardens on, in their front lawns, in the terraces. Uh, but honestly, um, the scale of the investment is beyond us. Um, that's needed. And we really do need support from the federal government here. Um, as I mentioned, in just our first four watershed studies, um, in, in looking at a combination of both green and gray infrastructure improvements, we're already at $75 million, which is an absolutely unprecedented level for our stormwater utility. And um, I, I will take the opportunity to, to mention uh, representative that uh, while I appreciate the WIFIA funding, um, we don't actually need more opportunity to borrow. What we need is direct grants from the federal government in order to make these investments. And thank you so much, Mayor. And I'm gonna use my remaining time to ask Mayor Lance Bottoms to please respond to the question that was raised about uh, costs uh, and, and disparities in, in uh, serving your uh, people in Atlanta. Um, thank you for the question. We have tried to put equity at the center of everything that we do. And even when you look at a map of our city, what you will see is that the energy burden uh, primarily rests with communities that are lower income communities of color. And so what's been very helpful to us in Atlanta and even having this very complicated discussion about climate change is to speak to our communities in ways that it makes sense and it's impacting their day-to-day -day lives. So if we uh, speak of it in terms of how it impacts asthma, we have some of the highest asthma rates for children in our city. If I'm speaking with seniors like my mother, I'm speaking in terms of how much they are paying each month for their utility bills. It becomes a much easier conversation and gives us the opportunity to have broader buy-in than if we just speak of it um, in, in very complicated, hard to understand terms. Thank you, Mayor. And I see my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Representative Armstrong. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And through a really fortunate set of circumstances, two of my best friends in the whole world live in Atlanta. So I have had uh, what I consider the, the pleasure of spending an exorbitant amount of time in that city and it's fantastic. And I can even deal with the traffic, but I tend to wonder if some of the congestion is because uh, everything seems to be located on Peachtree and even my GPS gives up at certain points in times about where it's trying to go. But I also appreciate that we're doing this hearing and we're talking about community resiliency and talking about the upper Mississippi River Basin because we're on the Missouri River Basin and not all community resiliency exists in large cities. And I, those of you on the committee have known that I, I, I bring this up a lot. Uh, North Dakota understands firsthand as well as anyone uh, problems posed by severe weather events, whether it's droughts or flooding. And even like right, even now in our state, it's but we've got two thirds of our state in what is, uh, is a historical drought and the other third of our state, we got 12 inches of rain the other day. And oftentimes we, we just have to deal with these things. But that's a, that brings me to, a, I mean, the last thing, we need to finance these things, we need to fund these things. But part of the issue is, and we've experienced this, is the federal policy that dictates how to address these challenges while leaving little room for involvement at the state and the local level. Um, we're in the process of building uh, one of the largest Army Corps engineer projects in the country. Uh, it's the Fargo flood diversion. It's a nearly $3 billion project. This was made possible by having multiple levels of government involved and in participating in the project. Um, it's not always easy, though. In 2011, through the Missouri, I mean, we're a dam controlled river system, and we had a flood of our capital city in Bismarck on a dam controlled river system. And if you ask anybody in the, in the communities associated with this, they will say the Army Corps of Engineers spent a little too much time in the spring worrying about the nesting of a piped plover and not necessarily about getting water down the system so we didn't flood our capital city. So my question for Ms. Wallace is, um, as somebody who is, you've mentioned bringing together local stakeholders and supporting regional efforts, and can you, can you speak to the involvement of the federal government, both good and bad in resilience planet, and what works well and what possibly needs reform? Yeah, and I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges is getting everybody to understand each other and in the same room. And one thing we were able to do this past, in 2019, in a partnership with the Army Corps of Engineers, we um, tried a unique way of holding meetings where we went to each community and had them set the agenda instead of us sending the agenda. Um, and we had extraordinary feedback from ag representatives, from people who reside in, in cities and um, 
conservation interests. And they even said to each other, I'm so glad I met you in person and I can put a face to the issue and understand what you're saying better. And I think that's one major step forward that we can do to drive solutions. Because science can tell us one thing, but it's really gonna be up to the people to decide what solutions are best for their community. Um, challenges, one challenge that I might mention uh, working with the Army Corps of Engineers, while we find these great solutions and we want to partner through these great solutions, um, the Corps does have challenges um, that states have an executing project partnership agreement. Same things with local communities and nonprofits who want to advance private public partnerships. And that is because they require the non-federal sponsor to fully indemnify the Corps and assume operations and maintenance um, as prescribed by the Corps in perpetuity. And under a changing climate, that doesn't make sense. So if we could work with Congress to change that, that would be a really big deal for facilitating private investment along with the federal government. So we have a school being built in Bismarck in as far north and away from the river as you can possibly be. And we're, we're about, I think, seven months behind on a Corps of Engineers uh, watershed project. It's an acre and a half. We can't get our school built because we can't get a federal permit in basically a stubble field. So um, some of those frustrations exist and it's not its not a cost issue. I mean, like I said, they when you deal with their engineers and some of these really um, controversial projects without the Corps of Engineers involvement, we just, we couldn't get them done. And so we do appreciate them on that end. It's sometimes on the other end. How about NEPA review and environmental review? Do, I, I mean, we all want to ensure proper environmental protections, but there continue to be problems with the proper roles of federal, state, and local government. Do you have any opinion on that? 19 seconds? <laughs> In 19 seconds, I could say that we agree that environmental review is important. As with any process, continuously reviewing them and doing process improvements could always be a benefit to our projects. And I would just end with, I mean, we funding these projects is important, but being able to get them in the ground and get them started in a reasonable amount of time will, will not only, uh, I mean, help our communities, but will also help save money. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Rep Armstrong. Next, we'll go to Rep Huffman. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for once again, um, putting together a really interesting and, and important hearing. And uh, Mayor Satya Rhodes Conway, I want to thank you for making an important point. We're talking about resiliency and adaptation mainly today. Um, and in all of the uh, different impacts that we tackle, uh, whether it is trying to keep our coral reefs alive or our kelp forests in California, or to manage the wildland urban interface against the scourge of wildfires, or protecting coastal communities against rising sea levels, you know, we have to innovate, we have to adapt, we have to do all of that. But if we don't tackle decarbonization at the same time, the conditions are going to become so much worse. Uh, and eventually we won't be able to adapt and find resiliency. So I think you made that point quite well. And, and I thank you for doing that. Mayor Garcetti, thanks for uh, bringing up the, the water side of the uh, resilience and adaptation uh, leadership that you have shown. California water is complicated. And, uh, you know, we do hear a lot of misconceptions. You know, no dams have been built since 1979. And we could take folks out to see Diamond Valley Reservoir or Los Vaqueros or Warm Springs Dam in Sonoma. They have been built. Uh, and other things have been done. In fact, massive storage has been brought online using our groundwater aquifers and innovating in some of the ways that you discussed. Um, but when you spend an entire century building dams in every single place where it makes any sense, you do hit a point of diminishing returns and redirected impacts. And we're at that point now in California. So if we continue to try to apply that 20th century to solution, uh, solution to every challenge, uh, it, it's not going to get us there. We're going to spend a ton of money and not solve the problem. The things you mentioned, though, are creating resilience and bringing real wet water. Uh, to communities to make them more resilient. There, there's a friendly rivalry, of course, between the Bay Area and Los Angeles. Um, but I have to say, uh, in this respect, uh, you check all the boxes of innovative, sustainable water management um, in a better way, uh, I think, than, than many of my Northern California communities. We're playing catch up to your leadership. So thank you for that. And um, I want to just ask you and the other mayors in the time that I have left about 
an aspect of this climate crisis that, that really deserves more attention. And it is the urban heat island effect um, because you're also innovating in that respect and it has social justice and all sorts of other implications. But talk a little bit about what you're doing in Los Angeles to uh, mitigate that problem. And, and I'll ask the other mayors the same question. And I'll try to be really quick. Thank you so much for those words and for the great question and for your leadership. Um, for our most vulnerable populations, uh, Representative, we're combining short-term climate uh, adaptation measures like cool pavement, shade structures, cool pavement uh, where we have lighter asphalts that we're uh, pioneering in Los Angeles. It's about 10 degrees less on the ground and about two degrees less uh, in the ambient area, which JPL and NASA is helping us uh, work on. Also putting trees, not just dividing them by council district evenly, but putting them where the heat is the most, where often the poorest communities and the least shade exists. Moving towards shade as an equity issue, as I described earlier, are two of the main ways that we're looking at as well as, you know, obviously uh, cool rooftops and light rooftops as well being mandated in our building codes. And, and for the other mayors, if, if time allows, I'd love to hear from you. Um, in Atlanta, in partnership with Spelman College and Georgia Tech, we are studying this and also uh, working on a study that really will confirm what we already know, uh, that our marginalized communities are the one who are bearing the burden of this. And again, I'll give myself as an example, I live on the southern part of our city, a primarily African-American community. My monthly utility bill uh, rivals uh, small commercial establishments. Um, and that is not unusual. And so um, it, it, not only is it creating an, a, an issue uh, that we literally can feel, but it's also creating an issue that's a burden um, in our pocketbooks, uh, pocketbooks on a monthly basis. Thank you, Representative. I, I think in Madison, just really briefly, we are also leaning into the urban forest, um, but we need building solutions. And frankly, the reason that we're not able to do more uh, in Madison is because in Wisconsin, the, the building code is controlled at the state level, and we are preempted from exceeding that. I would love to be exploring more solutions around white roofs, different building technology, efficient and sustainable heating and cooling options like heat pumps. Um, but I, you know, I'm very constrained in what I can do um, by state preemption. Wow. Thank you for that. Thank you, I yield back, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Rep Huffman. Next, uh, we'll go to Congressman Crenshaw of Texas. Welcome, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, important hearing, you know, we're talking about resiliency to uh, weather and, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to focus on flooding because uh, look, we're used to the heat and uh, we're used to floods. So in, in Houston, um, but we, we got, we got to get our, our facts straight and understanding the problem so that we can arrive at the right solutions because oftentimes it rains here, uh, rains a lot here. And then we hear that, well, that's climate change. That's what climate change looks like. But, but the thing is, and, and, it, this, I'm not, and I'm not denying climate change, of course, but what we do have to get straight is the rhetoric surrounding it. Um, we are in a humid subtropical, subtropical climate. We're on the Gulf of Mexico, 10 winding waterways. Uh, we have historically, uh, we're historically prone to flooding. This last month, everybody was talking about, it was May, that we had 11 inches of, uh, of, uh, of rain overall and it was considered ex exceptional. Um, it's actually the median, and you know I can go back to 1888, and just from that far back, you can find 11 inches of rain for the month. So it does happen, it's not going to change anytime soon. We hear that we've had more 500 year floodplains or 500 year floods in the last decade than ever before, but this is actually a clever distraction from the real point, because the 500 year flood is an insurance term, and that floodplain boundary changes based on urban development. So if we're trying to prove that it's associated with, with climate change, we'd have, to, we'd have to talk about rainfall and we haven't seen that data yet. I'm not saying we won't. Um, indications say that we might and we should, and we should reduce carbon emissions as, as a just in case scenario. I, I, again, we're in agreement on that. But to talk about flooding and resiliency, we do have to focus in on what really causes it. And it's a lack of infrastructure planning and it's poor development planning that really doesn't take into account the long history 
of normal rainfall that we, we have in Houston. So again, it is important to have the discussions on this committee about reducing carbon emissions long-term. Um, there's an agreement in the outcome desired there. I think we have disagreement on what solutions we would prefer. When we talk about resiliency, that conversation just has to happen whether climate change is a factor or not. Um, because the reality is the rain in Houston isn't going to change much no matter what we do. And we just need to be prepared for it as we have more people. Um, so, so Ms. Wallace, I wanna talk about the, the barriers that are in place with respect to that development. Um, you're, you're, you're not, you don't work in Houston, but you understand the challenges uh, you know, how long has the Mississippi River Basin been flooding? And, and how long has the federal government known this is a problem? Uh, and have they really devoted the funds necessary to that problem? We've, we've been watching major flood events happen since uh, at least 20, 2008 was probably an, a major one that set this course for we need to develop a systemic plan for flood um, and how floods are conveyed and stored. And in the middle of that, 2012, some other periods, we've seen some pretty consequential droughts. Um, knowing that the two are intermixed, we want to plan for both in an integrated way. But to speak to your question about, you know, what are the flow frequency profiles? Uh, the Corps of Engineers is working on updating that. Just last year, the Corps of Engineers also updated a two-dimensional model. And actually, it was a, not updated. It was a new two-dimensional model to, to provide that tool for planning that you, you know, underscore of the importance along the entire Mississippi River. So now we can understand what happens when you put a structure in there, you add conveyance and look at the effects all around. And that hopefully will allow our planners in the local communities to build resilience around that and fit that within a system plan. Does that fit in your question? A, a little bit. I mean, it, what, what I'm getting at is it, it does seem that we, we can add funding to this, but there's problems with the way we're modernizing the process uh, by which by which we actually approve and plan for these for these projects. How can we do better on that? That's a great question. Um, you know, broadly speaking, we work at a full regional scale and then work with our state partners and our local partners. Having all hands on deck, having that shared vision, um, leads to an approval process on the Lower Missouri River. Um, for example, you'll after the twenty I think twenty nineteen flood. Uh, there was a community there that, that um, the levee district itself worked to expand the river floodplain by doing a levee setback. And that came at a local level, but the state endorsed that, the federal government endorsed that. They knew that they needed to recover somehow. That's a great example that should be highlighted across the country as a way that all levels of government, all the way down to the residents who work there, uh, come up with a solution that takes account just current flooding and what's projected long-term. I'm out of time. Thank you. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Rep. Naguz. Welcome. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for holding this important hearing today. And I want to say thank you to uh, each of the witnesses for testifying and for their service uh, to our country and to their respective communities. Uh, nationwide, as we've heard during the course of this hearing, our local communities are struggling to keep up with the challenges of climate change from extreme weather impacts to natural hazards, uh, such as uh, flooding, as uh, was just previously mentioned, and of course, wildfires, uh, which is particularly important for uh, me and for my state. Uh, I represent the great state of Colorado, as many of you know, and in 2020, uh, we had a devastating and historic year uh, for wildfires. Uh, three of the five largest fires in state history occurred in the last year, and two of those were in my congressional district, the Cameron Peak Fire and the East Troublesome Fire. Unfortunately, we can expect to see fires of this magnitude in the coming decades if we don't address climate change in a bold way. And I certainly want to thank uh, the mayors for their work in this regard. Additionally, communities are still building back in Colorado uh, after we saw historic and devastating floods in 2013, which caused over 11,000 people to be evacuated, damaging 19,000 homes and tragically claiming several lives. Local emergency management officials have stressed the need for increased flexibility from FEMA to allow for building back better in the wake of these natural disasters. Uh, we have a bill, uh, the Climate Resilient Communities Act, which would help us do so, and we're certainly excited about uh, moving that to the floor. But in my view, the most meaningful pathway towards achieving uh, what I've described is through the establishment of a 21st century civilian climate core, which, uh, as I know, uh, the witnesses are certainly aware, uh, the president has announced his support of. Uh, ultimately, it would ensure that we make bold investments in climate solutions and the workforce needed to implement them. Uh, and in particular, for purposes of, of my state, 
uh, the work uh, that is necessary in our public lands, wildfire resiliency, mitigation, and so forth. And so I wonder, uh, Mayor uh, Garcetti, as well as um, uh, Press Mayor Bottoms, if either of you are familiar with the Climate Conservation Corps proposal, and uh, if you might be able to opine or expound a bit on uh, how it might impact your respective communities. Absolutely. Uh, it's a, a great program, um, one that I'm incredibly supportive of, and one which um, I'm not waiting for the feds, uh, though looking forward to federal uh, enacting of this. We've uh, launched an Angelino Corps here, building on something that was the Los Angeles Conservation Corps for a long time. It actually does amazing work because it takes some uh, youth who have faced the toughest environments, coming out of the foster system, um, being in juvenile halls, et cetera, and turns them into environmental stewards, it helps them graduate from high school. Um, they work sometimes past and even through college, um, as well as other folks who are returning, uh, either from the criminal justice system um, or folks who are just interested in helping out. And so coming out of the pandemic, we're gonna be doing hundreds of these. Uh, looks like the state of California will match that and double that. So we might have as many as a thousand Americans who are in there going door to door and making sure the questions from Republican and Democratic members alike during this session are addressed. Uh, get that energy help to poor uh, Americans in my city. Get uh, folks who can help uh, weatherize homes. He'll let people know about the rebate programs, et cetera, that's out there and let them be empowered not to be passive uh, recipients, but active participants in this struggle. Um, and thank you for the question. I am not familiar with the program, but it does sound extremely interesting. And again, going back to the equity focus that we have from our administration, uh, youth engagement, uh, workforce development training is a huge part of that, especially um, as we go into the summer months and we are experiencing uh, all the other challenges uh, after COVID re related to an, an uptick in crime, kids being out of school, et cetera, we have a very keen focus on youth development and workforce engagement. So it is something that I am certainly interested in learning more about and would um, definitely align uh, with what our focus um, will be over the next several months. Thank you both. Uh, and Mayor Rhodes Conway, if you'd like to add, if, if you're familiar with the program. Yeah, thank you, Representative. Uh, I am familiar with the, the proposal and, and I'm a big fan. We would definitely use it in Madison. Uh, we have a similar uh, uh, project that uh, we support through the city, um, engaging uh, disconnected youth in our conservation parks in particular, um, which I'm, we have increased under my administration. But similarly, we have uh, our green power training program here in the city of Madison, where we have hired, uh, we hire trainees and train them on solar installation, uh, LED light uh, conversion. And we are hoping to expand uh, further into uh, some of the green uh, infrastructure work that we're doing, forestry, et cetera. Um, it, to date, uh, our trainees are 73% people of color and 33% women. Um, these folks can go on to careers in these industries, but what has happened is that we are hiring them into our public works department, diversifying those departments and setting them on the path to a good family supporting job in the long term. I'm very proud of this program. I think every city in the country could do something like this in addition to state governments and uh, private companies as well. Um, and I really think that we need to be investing in our youth uh, and our workforce in a way that is sustainable and grows these good green job careers. Thank you. I see my time has expired. But again, thank you to each of the mayors. Uh, very much appreciate your testimony. And in particular, uh, to Mayor Bottoms, uh, thank you as you uh, near the end of your term. Uh, we want to say thank you for all the great work you've done down in Atlanta. With that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Next, we'll go to uh, Rep. Carter of Georgia. Uh, welcome. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all of you for being here, uh, especially the mayors. I was a mayor in another life, and I, I know what a, um, what a challenging position it can be, and I appreciate your interest in this. And uh, having said that, I'll start with you, Ms. Wallace, since you're the only non-mayor on the panel. Ms. Wallace, in your testimony, you say um, we will benefit from the rich history of multi-jurisdictional cooperation, pulling from the unique strengths of our federal partners and other public and private stakeholders. What are the unique strengths of, of the federal government that, that, that they can bring to governments like yours, or partnerships like yours, I should say? Thank you for that question. 
So on the Upper Miss, we were previously, UMRBA was a federal state commission and we were born from that. And so we had this underlying history since the 1970s of working in a very tight partnership between the federal agencies and the states. Um, our federal agencies range from the Army Corps of Engineers, which with its engineering of the river system, um, also its ecological restoration program. We have the Fish and Wildlife Service, which offers its unique um, uh, role in terms of wildlife management, ecological processes, um, FEMA with its role on uh, hazard uh, planning and response, as well as US EPA with oil spill response planning and mapping. Um, and then uh, with USGS, their science research arm, um, NOAA, National Weather Service, with both its drought, integrated drought planning and resources, and then also its um, prediction, forecasting prediction capabilities and understanding of the history of, of climate in the Upper Miss. Um, so all right. of that together is, is fantastic. Okay, well, let me ask you this then. When, when is the federal government an obstacle or a burden to you? Um, you know, sometimes when, when each agency might have their own um, perspective for how things go forward, but as within any family, um, you might have disagreements here or there or challenges for moving forward, but we strive to overcome those. Again, one that I've highlighted earlier is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Project Partnership Agreements. If those could be more shared in terms of their liability, we would have far more uh, and faster, I think more efficient um, agreements between the Corps and the non-federal sponsors. Okay. Well, you emphasize in, in your testimony how different um, communities are linked and the need for a shared vision for resiliency. And, and I want to thank you for that because I, I agree and I believe that Representative Palmer was the one who pointed out how important resiliency is. Representing the entire coast of Georgia, I can tell you that we need to build up our resiliency. There's no question about that. And that is not a partisan issue. So it's very important. Um, thank you, Ms. Wallace. Mayor Bottoms, I wanted to ask you, you've committed Atlanta to 100% uh, renewable clean energy by 2035. And I know that in Los Angeles that they've committed to be 100% by 2045. And in, in route to that in LA, in Los Angeles, they've, they've had rolling blackouts as a result of depending on, on um, renewable energy that has turned out not to be as, as dependable. And we all understand the, the concerns of that. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, as, you know, as a Georgian, I'm very proud of what we've done. I, we're, not, we're in the top 10 in solar energy. We, um, you know, we've got the only nuclear reactor find this hard to believe but with the number one forestry state in, in the country and and you know we we have we serve as carbon sinks but how, how are you going to achieve this this 100 percent renewable by 2035 and avoid these rolling blackouts well thank you for the question we uh, have been very thoughtful in our planning with this and in fact we had an earlier deadline uh, to achieve this goal. And we extended the deadline because we wanted to make sure that we were thoughtful. A huge part of that has been working with our utility partners, making sure that Georgia Partner, uh, Georgia Power has been a part of this discussion because we want to make sure that as we work to achieve that goal, that it's beneficial for all of our communities. And so if that means that we have to further extend the deadline, which I certainly hope we will not have to do, but if we have to do that to make sure that we get it right, uh, we will certainly do that and continue to have at the table, front and center, our utility partners uh, to make sure that it's achievable. Okay, thank you, Mayor Bottoms. And again, thank all of you on the panel for this important discussion. And Madam Chair, I'll yield back. Ma thank Madam you, Chair, Madam. could I ask a point of clarification? Would, would yes. it be possible? Would it be possible to just give Mayor Garcetti a few seconds to clarify that there haven't been any rolling blackouts in California because of renewable energy? Cor correct, and it's the second congressional hearing uh, where, unfortunate mischaracterization, you know, Los Angeles has never had a single rolling blackout. Um, you can speak about California more broadly, Mr. Huffman, but I would uh, just want to establish that for the record. We have not, and we never did because of renewable energy. It's the second uh, time in a congressional uh, hearing that's been put forward, and I very respectfully just want to correct the record. 
Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, next, we are gonna go to Rep Brownlee. I think she's gonna come right back. So in the meantime, why don't we go to uh, Rep Miller. Rep Miller, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Caster. And Ranking Member Graves, I, I just wanna thank you all for being here today. And you know, like many of my colleagues, Sitting on the committee, my district in West Virginia has been gravely impacted by extreme weather events. And I feel for the Americans who have been impacted by natural disasters. And I look forward to using this hearing and future hearings to learn more about what actions that we can take to create real concrete results to mitigate the damage and save lives. My district in Southern West Virginia has a history of flooding in 2016, three schools in one rural county were completely destroyed, which basically by flooding, which it's, you know, the, the schools are the center of the communities. And so it halted learning, it de deprived the residents of the places that, you know, they went for everything. And um, it's taken years for this to be changed and, you know, the schools to come back up. These catastrophic floods cost 23 lives at that time and our communities are still in a recovery process but that isn't it's it's history but it's happening right now last night in West Hamlin in Lincoln County which is in my district they were hit by severe flooding and at least 50 families were trapped in their homes and it damaged many others and, you know, my prayers go out to these people who are affected in West Hamlin in Lincoln County. But, you know, we need to figure out what to do. And that's why it's so important for us to understand what steps the federal government can take to help create real results. Um, destroying our American energy infrastructure and instead relying on foreign sources of energy will create more global carbon emissions. We need to do more to shore up our supply chain of critical minerals so we can produce energy of all kinds here in America and create jobs for our constituents. And in the meantime, we've got to prepare our communities to mitigate damage from these extreme weather events and promote policies that prioritize resiliency. Mayor Road Conway, in your testimony, you mentioned the dangers that flooding presents to the city of Madison, Wisconsin. What steps has Madison taken to promote resiliency from flooding? And how do you empower your citizens to engage in pre-disaster mitigation for their homes? Thank you, Representative. Uh, it's an excellent question and, and flooding really is an issue. I'd like to point out that, that Madison, uh, like many other places, really experiences several different types of flooding. So uh, we are between lakes. Uh, and so when the lake levels rise uh, over time, and I will say that uh, our, our lake levels have been rising significantly over time um, due to increased precipitation, um, that will cause a backup of our sewer and stormwater system. So there's that problem that we face. There's also the problem of larger rain events. And while we may be getting the same amount of water uh, over time, uh, it is coming in more severe storms so that more of it comes at once. And so then we have both the, the sort of regular local ponding in our streets and um, wet basement issues. And then we have the, the really severe crises like we saw in, in 2018 with the thousand year flood. As to what we're doing, it's again, because we're facing multiple types of flooding, it has to be a multi multifaceted approach. Um, we are, as I said, studying all of our watersheds to understand where flooding occurs and what improvements we can make in our stormwater system, whether that be about gray infrastructure, pipes, et cetera, or green infrastructure to address these issues. Um, but we also uh, completely revamped uh, our codes, to our stormwater code, so that future buildings must be built to accommodate uh, the, the higher chance of flooding in our community. Uh, so that, that we, when buildings get built from now on, uh, they will be less likely to be impacted by flooding. And one of the major things we did there was uh, that we used to say, you just have to pay attention to your own property. 
um, which of course means that you can just push the, the water problem off onto whoever's downhill from you. Uh, now we're requiring uh, folks to take in, into account the entire system um, and, and need not to push you, their problems. I wanna ask you one more quick question. Of course. You know, our rural communities often lack the resources available to the larger cities to engage in pre-disaster mitigation, as well as promoting resiliency. As your role as the co-chair of the climate mayors, how do you think we can help empower these neighborhoods, these communities? Thank you, Representative. Another excellent question. Um, I really believe that there's an opportunity for the federal government to partner with local governments uh, so that we can identify and scale solutions that are working in one place that may work in another place. And I do think that the, you know, cities are the laboratories of democracy. Um, we are learning things, we are innovating, and we are happy to share that knowledge and spread it. Um, I work closely with my partners, smaller cities uh, in rural areas in Wisconsin, um, and I think that model is something uh, that could work across the country. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Rep Miller. All right, next, uh, let's see, I don't see a couple of members that we're going to try to come back. So, uh, Ranking Member Graves, are you prepared for your questions? Good. You're recognized for five minutes. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, all the witnesses, uh, mayors and Ms. Walsh, thank you all very much for your testimony. It was, it was, it was a big help. So I, I, I want to ask what I kind of touched on in the opening statement. Um, how, how, look, you could do all sorts of things in order to try and address resilience. What are some of the guiding principles that you're using to try to identify uh, the investments that you're making, uh, Mayor, Mayor Garcetti? I think, look, you have to have collaboration. You can't just come with an empty hat in hand to Washington, so demanding local and state participation. But as Representative Miller said, conscious of uh, the differences between communities and the resources folks have. Second, empower everyday people. Third, make it good for everybody's bottom line. So when you do incentives on energy or water uh, conservation, you can reduce consumption as the quickest way and cheapest way to save everybody money from the construction side to the bill side. And I'd say fourth too, look at where you can have a multi-benefit um, of anything you do. Create local jobs for at-risk youth while you're uh, uh, making your resilient city uh, build out and doing something about the climate emergency. Uh, those are the principles that we engage with uh, every single day. Mayor, thank you. That's that's helpful. And I'll tell you, there, there are a number of things that I've been seeing done across the country that I have strong concerns with because I I don't feel like that they're, they're as you said, you're talking about dual benefits and making sure that it results in a positive cost of benefit. But unfortunately, I've seen a, a lot of things around the country that don't appear to be doing that. Look, I, I'm not going to proliferate rumors, but but I've, um, I've, I've read some things that uh, Curry Yoga and Taj Mahal may be in your future. And I don't want to... Um, I don't, I don't want to uh, cause any problems at all. So feel free, wave me off, or, or, or provide it in writing if you if you'd like in the future. And I, I mean that. Um, if if you look at what's happening, some of the models showing all of this transport, all of this the the the, the additional uh, emissions coming from from countries in Asia like China. Um, how does that make you feel that you're there trying to be aggressive, leaning forward? Meanwhile, you've got these extraordinary emissions. And in fact, China just even said this week that they may put the brakes on some of their reductions. Uh, again, uh, feel free to respond in writing no, later. If you I'm, want I'm to. Happy no, to. I, mean that. I do. I do. No, I appreciate it. And I'm happy to actually answer it because, you know, as chair of C40 cities, these are the 97 mega cities in countries like China, India, across Africa, the Americas, Oceania. Um, and I'll say this, you know, the, of those 97 cities, 54, I believe, of them have exceeded, met or exceeded their uh, promises in the Paris Climate Accord. They come from China. They come from uh, countries that uh, haven't met those um, goals, including our own. There's only two countries in the world that have met their pledges, and that's, I think, the Gambia and Morocco. So it's not like we have a lot of countries that are meeting the mark, but cities, I think, are inspiring those nations to do better. It's the citizens of Beijing, when we have those monitors up in the U.S. Embassy, that said, our air quality, we now know what it is, and we're empowered to do something about it. I think that's what America can do best around the world, is really empower that grassroots to say to their own national leaders, through their civic city leaders, let's do better. And that mayor-to-mayor -mayor conversation happens beautifully at a global level, too. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to want to follow up with you maybe in writing after this, but I, I want to turn very quickly. Ms. Wallace, um, uh, can you talk a little bit, uh, again, I love that uh, Mayor Garcetti quote from uh, in regard to, to NEPA, 
Um, it, it's a great quote and I use it all the time. Um, but but uh, Ms. Wallace, can you talk a little bit, I've heard uh, Mr. Uh, Congressman Kelly and others talk about frustration with implementation. Can you talk about some of the challenges y'all have had with trying to implement resiliency efforts that are obstructed by uh, some of the red tape? I know Nest and others are priorities of you and your organization. Yeah, NESP is a, a priority that we hope to see move forward, uh, both for resilience of the navigation system, but also for the ecosystem. And um, like I think what was said earlier, we want to act now so we are prepared and we are resilient going forward into the future. If we delay action, that that's really problematic. Our understanding of the delay in NESP is um, a, a decision within uh, the Office of Management and Budget not to put it in the budget. Um, and so... We understand that, that the last administration had agreed at the Department of Agriculture level, core level, um, and ultimately it was decided within OMB. And so we're hopeful to get the um, funding for, for NESP to move forward. Um, again, that was a, an agreement reached by stakeholders, by all the states and the federal agencies and um, navigation and conservation interests. This is our way forward. It was really insightful and innovative and would answer a lot of our challenges ecologically to the resilience. Thank issues. you. Um, Mayor uh, Rhodes Conway and, and Mayor Bottoms, I apologize. I do have some questions for you, but I'm, I'm out of time. So we'll see if we do a second round or maybe I'll submit them in writing. Yield back. Great. Thank you, Rep. Graves. Uh, next, I'll recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Um, thank you again to all, all of these terrific witnesses. Uh, you know, there are so many technological advancements that we can use to help lower electric bills for, for all of our neighbors. And uh, Mayor Rhodes-Conway, you've kind of hit on one of the stumbling blocks and that's the fact that uh, you're preempted from, from uh, kind of implementing certain, certain new standards, uh, kind of bringing in some of the modern technology. Uh, this is a problem in other states too, uh, where local communities are bound by state laws that prohibit the adoption of modern codes and standards that are proven to reduce uh, pollution and help bring online some of the some of the smart uh, smart technology. So as we we craft legislation in the Congress, how do we address that? Uh, how do we? You know, we, we don't like to take a too heavy of hand. We don't need a, th that kind of national hammer, but we're going to have to help local communities get these things done. How do we do that? It, it, thank you, Chair Castor. It's an excellent question. And, and uh, you know, the, the principle that I would use to guide you here is the principle of floors, not ceilings. And um, that the, the federal government, state governments should set a, a, a minimum requirement and allow uh, subsidiary units of government to exceed that. So for example, if the state of Wisconsin set a, a floor on our building and energy codes, but allowed jurisdictions like Madison or Green Bay or La Crosse um, to exceed that, uh, given our local conditions, for example, flooding, um, I think that it would allow us the flexibility that we need, um, but not require everybody to hit that higher standard that Madison might want to hit. Um, so I do think that, that anything that could get states to that principle and philosophy would be extremely important and, and valuable to us. Um, failing that, I think, you know, incentivizing states to move towards adoption of the, the greatest codes. You know, here in Wisconsin, uh, we ignored the last code update. We didn't adopt the, the national standard. And so we're falling behind every day. Now, thankfully, Governor Evers is, is taking action to, uh, to move forward on that. But uh, nonetheless, it leaves us really vulnerable at, at the local level of not being able to do the things that we need to do to protect our community. Yeah, thank you so much. It's so just such common sense and, and we have to use every tool in the toolbox. Um, and it's been good to hear during this hearing that there is uh, bipartisan recognition that the burdens of the climate crisis often fall upon working class, uh, our working class neighbors and our black and brown neighbors. You know, FEMA is currently seeking help from cities and the public to, to change the way 
they address climate threats for underserved communities. Uh, but my question to all of our, uh, our whole panel, what, what can Congress do now to, you know, now we're marching forward to hammer out the American Jobs Plan. What do we need to include to help your cities uh, center environmental justice across the board uh, from transportation to water infrastructure and housing? What needs to be uh, said and done throughout uh, legislation that we intend to pass? Start with, um, let's go in the same order, uh, Mayor Garcetti, uh, you can start. Check your audio, Mayor. Our time is limited and it's a, such a huge question. I would say yeah, that the most important thing to do is to make sure that you're demanding some equity measures in there because you can't fund equity enough. But if you if you put equity, either has to be the data has to be collected or that you have to um, show the output of hitting all communities, something that I heard across both Democratic and Republican questions today. I think that's a way to make sure that these jobs are local, do local hire for all this infrastructure. Please, please, please allow that and embed that, not just a waiver from the feds on DOT, on water projects, et cetera. And let's create a whole workforce uh, so this isn't just about doing something for this legislation, but really creating career pathways that will be the climate warriors of this next generation. Uh, Mayor Bottoms, why don't we go to you and then the others, you can submit uh, answers for the record. Very quickly, um, small grant funding to our partners and also flexibility in funding. I'll just go back a few years to Hurricane Katrina. You think of Atlanta, we are an inland city, uh, not expecting uh, any impact, major impact from hurricanes, but we uh, had to take in a, a huge amount of the population of New Orleans climate refugees into our city. So these unexpected uh, uh, expenditures that we experience uh, too often now. So any flexibility that we have and, and uh, expediency in getting funding directly to our cities would be helpful. I certainly hear that from my mayor here in Tampa as well. Uh, don't park, park it through the state, get it to the local communities that know how to, to get things done. Uh, you all have been a terrific panel, and I appreciate the uh, involvement of all of our committee members today. Uh, thank you. So without objection, I'm going to enter some uh, documents into the record. Uh, before I do that, I want to, I know uh, Congressman Crenshaw brought up some issues on the sources of flooding, the causes. I'll tell you, the our uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric uh, Administration, they have the most up-to-date scientific analysis on changing temperatures, changing uh, precipitation patterns. I recommend them to you. And in fact, if you go back to the National Climate Assessment, it shows that uh, we're really talking about extremes here. The, the western and northern parts of the country are, are warming faster while uh, places that typically get a lot of rainfall are getting more of it in many of those extreme events. So take a, if, if folks who may be watching this hearing have questions, go dig into some of those maps, find out what's happening in your location because the climate crisis is impacting communities across America in different ways. But we know we're paying more and we're all suffering through many of these extreme events and we're gonna to have to become more resilient to them. So without objection, I'd like to enter into the record a June 3rd letter from Water Use Florida representing water utilities and communities throughout the state of Florida, encouraging Congress to invest in water recycling programs as a part of an infrastructure package to help communities build resilience and mitigate the impacts of climate change. A June 10th letter from the American Society of Civil Engineers detailing the critical need for investment in our nation's infrastructure, the serious consequences if we fail to act, and the advancements in resilience across all infrastructure sectors that can be achieved by ensuring infrastructure meets modern codes and standards to protect public health and safety. With that objection, all members will have 10 business days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses. I ask our witnesses to please respond promptly. Thank you again. Uh, the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis now is adjourned. Have a great weekend.